Okay, thanks for the introduction, Cassie, and thank you all for coming. Um, this is <laughs> this is kind of like uh, one of those research tangents. I don't know if anybody else has this ex experience, but whenever I'm doing research, I just find other things that are that are interesting to me. Um, that I if I find time, I pursue them. Um, and sometimes they work out and they're interesting and like I might get a publication out of them, sometimes not. Sometimes they turn into dead ends or, you know, I find out somebody's already published on something or um, it just doesn't turn out to be as interesting as I thought it was. Um, so this is one of those. Um, and I think this one worked out, but uh, I'll leave it up to you guys after you hear the summary. Um, so the the tangent that I pursued here is what exactly is the meaning of the toponym? Tampa, the place named Tampa. Um, you know, uh, I the seeds of this actually go back further. Uh, I, when I first moved to Tampa in 2006 or so, I started hearing this legend um, that Tampa, I should get rid of this, that Tampa was a Calusa Indian word that meant sticks of fire. Um, and here's an example from the Tampa Tribune Times, 1981. Um, sorry, I'm having some issues. Okay, here's another example from the Miami News, going back a little further in 1982, that claims it's a Calusa word. Um, and here's one from the Orlando Sentinel um, from 1999 that says it's an Indian word. So, um, you know, I, I kind of, I'm always skeptical when I hear people translate place Indian place names, Native American place names, um, just because I know a lot of them um, are not accurate translations. And so I was a little bit skeptical about this idea that Sticks of Fire was the, the translation of Tampa. Um, but I just kind of filed it away because I was doing research elsewhere. I was working up the coast um, at Crystal River. Um, but eventually... In the past five or six years, my research turned more to the archaeology in Tampa. And so um, the the meaning of Tampa became kind of more pertinent to my research. Um, still a tangent, but kind of more related. Um, and what I quickly kind of figured out um, was that my suspicions were concern, confirmed um, that there really wasn't a good basis for this translation. Um, and there are two main problems. Um, one is one is a language problem. Um, Tampa, the name Tampa was first recorded um, in the 1550s. It first published in 1575 um, by this gentleman named Hernando de Escalante Fontaneda. Um, Fontaneda was a Spaniard born in Colombia, and he was traveling back to Spain for the first time as a teenager when his ship got um, shipwrecked in the Keys and he in the 1550s. And he was taken as a captive of native peoples and lived in South Florida um, with various native groups for about 20 years before he finally made it back to Spain and published this memoir. And in his memoir, he lists um, about 20 towns on the west coast of Florida and Tampa spelled T-A-N-P um, is one of those. Um, but the problem is Tampa is listed among a group of Calusa towns, and we only know about 100 words of Calusa, or th there are only about 100 words of Calusa that were ever recorded, and only about 12 of those have translations. So we know almost nothing about the Calusa language, and so, and Tampa is not one of those words, right? So we the just linguistically unless somebody discovers some new texts that have a uh, you know more of a calusa vo vocabulary we just can't say what tampa means um but remember i said there were two problems the second problem so language is the first problem second problem is geography because when fontaneda listed those towns he listed them in um, their order of occurrence from north to south. And archaeologists have been able to kind of match those up with archaeological sites. And um, John Worth, the archaeologist at uh, the University of West Florida, has made a good case that Tampa is, was not in Tampa Bay. Tampa was at the Pineland site um, down in Charlotte Harbor. 
So here's a second problem. People who want to translate Tampa and claim that whatever translation they're making refers to Tampa Bay or something specific about Tampa Bay, um, it doesn't make sense because Tampa wasn't in Tampa. Um, Spontaneta did list a couple towns that were in Tampa Bay. The most prominent of these was um, Tocobaga, which he put he he put at the like the far north end of the of the bay. Um, and um, we now think that this was probably at the Safety Harbor site in Old Tampa Bay, Upper Tampa Bay, um, and, um, and that's what drew me into this research when I started doing research at the um, at the at the Safety Harbor site, the presumed site of Tocobaga. So the Spaniards um, in the 1500s and 1600s, they actually called Tampa Bay, usually referred to it as the Bay of the Holy Spirit, but they also called it the Bay of Tocobaga. Um, but as time went on, as you get into the 1600s and 1700s, um, the, the Spanish and the English after them kind of got confused about the place names, the native place names and how they matched up. And so um, Tampa Bay was originally referred to Old Tampa Bay, what we know as Old Tampa Bay, up at the upper end of, of the bay. Um, and then eventually um, it, it's just started to be referred, the whole bay started to be referred to as Tampa Bay. So again, just to kind of sum up the problems, unless we discover more Calusa texts, the word Tampa or Tampa um, is never going to be translated with confidence. And the people who called themselves Tampa or Tampa did not live in what we now know as Tampa Bay. Um, so, you know, that might seem like a dead end, but it was actually kind of like, it, it kind of got me more interested is like, why do people think it's called, that the Tampa translates as sticks of fire? When did that legend develop? Um, and um, how has it changed over the years? So I took uh, you know some time and went through um, newspaper accounts and other sources, and what I discovered is that there are that um, sticks of fire is just kind of the more recent of four or five other translations that have been offered over the years since the 1800s, um, and this graph kind of um, plots those out by their frequency um, of mention in historic newspapers. Um, so you can see that there, you know, there's, uh, I'm going to go through these, so I won't read them off, but you can see that they've changed over the years in terms of what was sort of the preferred translation of Tampa. Um, so let's, let's just quickly take a look at some of these um, translations that have been offered over the years. Um, the first one that I've been able to discover um, was the translation of Tampa as near it or close by. Um, and this comes from a um, ethnographer by the name of Albert Gachet. He was a Swiss American ethnographer, and he put, he's most famous for this book called A Migration Legend of the Creek Indians. And so he makes this case, he says in this book, Tampa, um, and he translated it with, to this Creek word, I can't pronounce it, uh, itimpi, means close to it or near it. And he said that was Creek with a certainty. Um, and so this translation has it's you'll still see this repeated um, on the left is a um, a creek muskogean um, language dictionary from 1917 that repeated it um, on the right is a more influential more widely published book um, of florida place names of seminal uh, indian origin um, and it repeats this same legend that Tampa is a corruption of the Creek word Timpi or near it. That is that is a real Creek word, um, but um, there weren't any Creeks living here in the 1500s. There were no Muscogean language speakers in the 1500s. So it doesn't make sense to claim that um, Tampa is a Creek word. Um, and here's another repeat of this legend, and this is an, even in a more authoritarian, uh, a more authoritative text, uh, uh, Place Names in the United States by George R. Stewart, which is a frequently um, cited reference. Um, the idea here has generally been that um, it was near it because there was an Indian village near Fort Brooke, but again, that's a problem because Tampa wasn't in Tampa Bay, so it wasn't near Fort Brooke. Um, but uh, 
in this case, uh, George Stewart actually kind of says that maybe that is he does to his credit kind of realize that um, that that kind of association is probably not correct. Um, here's another translation. John John R. Swanton was probably one of the most famous um, native historians of the early 20th century. He worked for the Smithsonian Institution, widely published on the native peoples of the Southeast. He did not have much respect for Albert Gachet. He said Gachet um, decided to try to translate Tampa from the Creek language because that's the only language he knew. And he also said that Gachet thought that all the native peoples in the Southeast were the same. So Swanton was very dismissive of, um, of Gachet's translation. He offered another one. He thought maybe that um, the Calusa language was related to uh, Choctaw. And so he suggested that it might translate from as, as pale or bowl. There is a there's a word in the Choctaw language that is very similar to Tampa that means pale or bowl. Um, but Swanton, um, to his credit, was uh, never really confident in this. He said, you know, he, he he floated it more as a hypothesis, and you can see that here uh, in. Uh, Grismer's uh, history of Tampa and the Tampa Bay region. He quotes Swanton um, and says there's a possibility it was related to the Calusa was related to Choctaw and that there's a Choctaw word Itampa, which means paler bowl. But importantly, Grismer says um, Swanton adds that there's no authentic interpretation of the name and there's little hope there ever will be unless the Calusa vocabulary is discovered. So kind of reinforcing what I've already said, um, Swanton said back in the mid 1900s. Um, whether, you know, for whatever reason though, no one really paid much attention to those sources or Swanton's caution about the fact that it might never be translated. Um, and in the 1920s, uh, another legend developed that uh, Tampa translated as split wood for quick fires. And it's almost always repeated exactly like that, split wood for quick fires, um, which has a very kind of Native American sound to it, but they never say what language it came from. Um, so in this case, this uh, is from 1930, and you can see um, they, they talk about both legends nearby or split wood for quick fires, but they favor in this case, um, nearby, and they say that is incontrovertible. Um, here's another example. This is actually the earliest um, thing, I think, mention of the split wood for quick fires. It it doesn't have a real good provenience. This is in, a, in the Hillsborough County Library, and they say it's from 1910, but they, they don't have the whole newspaper information, so I'm not too confident about that. But it's interesting, nevertheless. Um, and this one's kind of interesting also because it, it, it they kind of have a, have a sense of humor about it, almost like they weren't taking it too seriously. Um, so this says, history says that Tampa is a seminal Indian word, which reduced to Americanese means wood or heavy wood or split wood for quick fires. Tampa has always been known as hot stuff, and the wise Seminole knew what he was doing when he looked over the list of Pullman Palace car names and gave us Tampa. Um, so this legend, like, like I said, was pretty prominent in the early 20th centuries, the 19-teens, the 1920s. Here's another example where um, they take kind of a humor, humorous approach to it. I'll draw your attention here. It says, why this particular peculiar cognomen should have been selected for the Indian town, if it was so selected, or what significance it had, the legend does not tell us, but the name has an Indianesque sound. So let's let it pass. And you can see this is, you know, it's it's also one thing I'm going to come back to. It's also kind of part of the civic promotion that's going on. So here, the story of Florida, an empire blessed by the creator. Um, a lot of guidebooks in the 1920s, you know, as tourism started to increase in Tampa, there were, or in Florida in general, there were more guidebooks published, and a lot of these repeat the same legend. So here's one from 1926 that's got a really funny title. 
um, let's go to Florida information those for those who haven't been but are going, those who have been and are going back, and those who don't expect to go but will. Um, and they repeat this thing about this translation of split wood for quick fires. And here's another one too. And I just use this one to point out that the presumption here too is that split wood for quick fires must mean that there was a lot of um, not wood or light wood in Tampa Bay. Um, but of course, um, Tampa wasn't in Tampa Bay, so it doesn't make sense. Now, um, you know, this continued to be kind of the favored one. And then there was a transition in the 1970s um, where I don't know how it developed, but somebody shortened it to just sticks of fire. Um, and the first reference I've been able to find is from 1974, um, a tour of Tampa, um, where the writer of this an anonymous writer says that, um, you know, before starting the tour, it's important to note that Tampa means sticks of fire. Um, from the Calusa language. And that didn't go anywhere for a little while, but in the later 70s, the Tampa Chamber of Commerce evidently kind of latched onto this one, maybe because it was simpler and shorter um, and made better promotional, ma promotional material. So you can see this is kind of a funny section, special advertising section from a newspaper in 1979, the Tampa Tribune, that's called Tampa, a city on the move. Um, and among the facts of, of Tampa Bay, um, Tampa, they say Tampa means sticks of fire, and the name was given us to, by the Calusa Indians. Um, so the Chamber of Commerce kind of promoted this. Um, and another evidence of the Chamber of Commerce promoting it is um, in the early 1980s, the University of Tampa um, and the city of Tampa together decided to put up a sculpture in Plant Park, that little park that's right next to the University of Tampa campus. And the, the Chamber of Commerce suggested that the sculpture be sticks of fire. And they commissioned an artist um, from Wisconsin to uh, create this sculpture called Sticks of Fire. Um, and you can read the comment here. Our friends at the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce say is the ending meaning of the word Tampa. Um, so uh, this is the, if you've been to the, the sculpture is still there in Plant Park. Um, this is the newspaper article from 1984. Um, when it was finally completed, um, you can see it's these metal spires, these seven metal spires that go up from a fountain. Um, and uh, the artist, talks a lot about the symbolism of those seven spires. Um, the interesting thing that uh, that he does in this article is that he draws a connection with lightning for the first time. You know, he says that sticks of fire is a reference uh, to the to the word to the place named Tampa, and that it probably means firewood. But he also says that he thinks it would be appropriate if it also meant lightning. Um, because people say Tampa is the lightning capital of the world, and also because he had to ground these big metal things so if they got struck by lightning. Um, so he, as far as I can tell, this artist was the first one to actually draw the connection of sticks of fire with lightning and not just with firewood. Um, and so I think this sculpture is one of those things that helps propel sticks of fire to be the kind of commonly accepted, um, if still really erroneous translation of, of Tampa. Um, here's the sculpture today. Like I said, it's still standing and you can um, read the plaque where he explains the symbolism. It was not a popular sculpture. Um, there were calls to have it removed from the park, um, but in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it also became sort of a, a, of a landmark of sorts. So it was the used for a um, chili cook-off and they had the chili cook-off at the at, around the sculpture. There was also a mass marriage ceremony um, at the at the sticks of fire sculpture. Um, and then also perhaps a little bit more important to kind of spreading this myth, uh, there was also an AIDS benefit that started in the early 1990s that was called the sticks of fire. Um, charity and it was basically a um like a progressive dinner 
that ended on the University of Tampa campus right near the fountain um, with dessert there at the fountain. So this went on for about 20 years, uh, this Sticks of Fire AIDS benefit, which just kind of helped, you know, cement that legend, I think. Um, and then another thing I think that helped cement the legend um, in the early 2000s, uh, it's kind of strange to think about, but, you know, that was a period before Facebook, before even um, MySpace or any of those social um, network sites. The early 2000s, the blogs were still the thing. And um, there, this was when I, about the time I moved to Tampa, there was a blog called Sticks of Fire. Um, it was it was put together by a uh, musician in Tampa. Um, and it, it became very influential. It collected a lot of like political information, um, happenings around town. And you can see here, uh, there's this thing called the Wayback Machine where you can go back and find these old um, you know, websites and blog posts. So here's the about information from the, from the blog post from the early 2000s where he repeats this legend about Tampa um, translating as Sticks of Fire. And he says, some people say it's because of the firewood and kindling, but he agrees with those who say it's a reference to the constant barrage of lightning storms, sticks made of fire. Um, so I think this helped um, spread that legend too. Uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, but blogs got so popular for a little while that newspapers were publishing and uh, the blogs or information from the blogs. And um, this guy, Tommy Duncan, who was publishing the Sticks of Fire blog, um, won some awards and um, scooped the local newspapers on a couple of important stories. Um, so it was it was a pretty prominent um, blog. Like most blogs, it's kind of defunct now. Um, I think the the name has uh, been appropriated for other uh, other websites and the domain name. Last time I checked, it was still for sale for fifteen or twenty dollars, I think. So, um, and then the other thing I'd say, um, you don't get many archaeology talks where they talk about hockey too, right? Um, I think the other thing that kind of cemented this legend was the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning. The Lightning name did not have anything to do with sticks of fire. Um, Phil Esposito, who was the one that brought, uh, sort of brought uh, the lightning to Tampa and came up with the name, um, he said that he was just in a lightning storm in Tampa and came up with the name. But um, there's these fans that kind of attach themselves, this cheer squad that calls themselves uh, Sticks of Fire. Um, and uh, they, um, I think, you know, just further solidify this understanding of Tampa, meaning sticks of fire in a native language. There have been some other ones floated uh, in, you know, recent, relatively recent history. Um, a couple people have noted that uh, Tampa or Tampa means uh, lid or top in Portuguese. Um, so every once in a while, somebody goes to Portugal and sees the name Tampa on a trash can or something and comes back and thinks that they have um, solved the mystery and that Tampa actually means top or lid. Um, uh, you know, same problems here. There weren't any Portuguese here when the name was recorded in the 1500s. Um, and we know that it was a native place name and not a Portuguese place name. Um, and here's another example, more recent even. Um, where somebody um, is floating the name top or lid. So the other, you know, thing that I, that's interesting to me is why um, people want to believe these and what is our fascination with the meaning of Tampa. Um, and in thinking about this, I came across an article by a French scholar um, and she uses this idea of toponymic imaginaries. Um, and she makes the case that uh, people have used the, the place named Paris um, for a variety of social and political purposes. Um, it's been reimagined to describe everything from a particular flowers to a distinctive shade of blue to city lights and fashion. So I think, you know, we have to think about Tampa also um, being used for, or the place name Tampa being used for social and political ends too. They might be less urbane and sophisticated than, than Paris has been used, but um, they still get used nonetheless. 
for those kind of reasons. And I point out here on that uh, note that um, it's kind of easy to forget that Tampa was founded as a settler colonial city. It was the center of a political and center of political and economic control for an imperialist power, which was the United States, um, a, a young United States um, that was built on Aboriginal lands, uh, the, the lands of the Seminole people. Um, but with power and resources concentrated in the hands of a non-indigenous, that is mostly white, um, soldiers and homesteaders. Fort Brooke was established in 1824 um, to monitor activities um, on the Seminole lands and uh, the lands that they had been granted by treaty um, the previous year. But the granting of the lands and the establishment of um, Fort Brooke were always, you know, it was it was always, at least in some people's mind, intended that the Seminoles were going to be eventually removed to Oklahoma. Um, and that was especially true with Andrew Jackson. So for the, you know, and Tampa grew up around Fort Brooke in the 1830s. And for the white homesteaders who platted tan the Tampa on the outskirts of Fort Brook, you know, Tampa was probably just a place name. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that um, the, the lack of a clear association with the indigenous people that were still living in the area, the Seminoles, provided an advantage, um, especially, you know, after the decision was made to try to remove the Seminoles um, and the fort became one of the points of embarkation to forced embarkation to points west. It, to have adopted a place name in the language of the Seminole would have been to kind of admit that they had a title to the land, um, raising, you know, and raised issues of sovereignty and entitlement. Tampa was much more abstract connection to native peoples. Um, so it didn't have those kind of problematic associations. Over the years, you know, I think um, the question of what Tampa means has always been tied to kind of civic boosterism, and it's kind of tied to periods of Tampa's growth. So um, it became especially important in the 1920s, as I mentioned, with the travel guides. Um, and then here's an example from 1934, um, which is the 100th uh, anniversary of Hillsborough County. And you can see they're they're drawing on the Indian place name as reinforcement that Tampa was a good place to live. So you can read this for yourself, but basically say they're saying that the natives of that day had a good reason for picking this as a village site and the advanced white civilization of hundreds of years later um, came to the same conclusion, basically. So they're tying, you know, the favorable setting of Tampa to the place name um, and its origin in native languages. Um, and, you know, after a mid-century lull, Tampa's economy and um, uh, population boomed again in the 60s and 70s. And interest in the toponym has kind of followed the same trajectory. Um, more and more newspapers, uh, stories about it. And this is when the sticks of fire um, starts to be promoted by the Chamber of Commerce. Now, it's important to note again, the people who called themselves Tampa are not mentioned in historical records after about the 1500s. The Tokabaga, um, who did live in Tampa, managed to live freely on the fringes of the Spanish missions in northern Florida until about the early 1700s um, when they were attacked by a rival Calusa group. And this is an English map from 1721. If you have got a, this um, inset here, it's it, somebody has written a notation here, Tokabaga Indians destroyed 1709. Other Calusa groups managed uh, to resist Spanish colonialism until the early 18th century, mostly because they were kind of isolated in Southern Florida. Um, but when the mission, when the Spanish mission system in Northern Florida collapsed in 1715, um, the Creeks and the Yamases 
um, who were given guns by the English, started raiding for slaves um, and pushed the remaining Calusa far, far south into the Keys. And eventually the Spanish evacuated them from the Keys to Havana for their safety. So the people who called themselves Tampa, Tocobaga, Calusa are long gone along with their language. Um, but it's important to note that they they persist in the native peoples that moved into the region in the in later times. And I think, you know, the groups like the Seminoles and the Miccosukees that moved in probably absorbed um, refugees from Tampa, Tocobaga, the Calusa. Um, and this is a this is a census basically of of um Native towns in Tampa Bay, right on the eve of Fort Brooks founding. Um, this was done in 1822 by a Captain John Bell. And you can see he lists several of the, the Seminole towns in Tampa Bay um, at the time when Fort Brooks was founded. So even though the people who called themselves Tampa aren't around, I would say that they, you know, they persist in those native peoples, the Seminole and um, Miccosukee. They also persist archaeologically. Um, the discovery of Seminole graves during construction of Fort Brook uh, parking garage in 1980 um, in downtown Tampa paved the way for the establishment of the Seminole tribe of Florida's um, Tampa reservation um, and the casino that we have now. Um, unfortunately, there's not much to see of it there. Uh, all we have is the parking garage on top of uh, where Fort Brook used to be, um, and a little plaque that on, I think it's on Florida Avenue that um, describes the cemetery that was excavated. Um, but there are more visible remnants of those earlier native peoples that persist at archeological sites that are open to the public and do have things to see. So um, Tampa, as I noted, was probably located at the Pineland complex and um, the University of Florida operates the Randell Research Center there, um, and you can tour um, the site and see some of the mounds that were associated with the actual town of Tampa. Um, Tocobaga um, was, as I said, probably located, located at the Safety Harbor site in Philippi Park, uh, a Pinellas County Park, um, and you can see um, the mound there um, where the chief Tokabaga probably lived. You know, I think, and I don't want to discourage people. I want I want to encourage people from engaging with Native history. I just wanted to do it in the right way. You know, we've attached ourselves to uh, to the meaning of this toponym that will probably never be known. But there is na real Native history that you can engage with by visiting these archaeological sites. And I just want to, you know, kind of close by mentioning that I think it's important to remember that Tampa does have this native history because there's starting to be this mythology um, develop that says that um, North America is not stolen land. Um, there's a book that's getting some publicity now. It's actually by a, a, a Dutch uh, historian um, and it's called Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World. And he's actually making the argument that uh, that America was not stolen because uh, Europeans paid the Indians for the land, um, or that uh, or that Native Americans were dying out of European diseases, um, and so it wasn't their fault. It was just a biological factor. Um, so, you know, this is wrong. Uh, <laughs> And unfortunately, it even gets repeated um, by some politicians here um, in the last election. Uh, the debate that preceded the election to run, our governor said that it's wrong to teach students that the U.S. was built on stolen land because it isn't true. And this is actually the Daily Show kind of making fun of that. And you'll see they're, they're pointing out all the place names in Florida that are derived from Native Americans um, and uh, kind of mocking DeSantis for saying that because it's those place names kind of argue the contrary, right? And they argue that uh, that Florida is or was uh, native lands and um, it, it was stolen. Um, so 
uh, again, you know, I think it's important to engage with that native history and Tampa needs to recognize its native history more, but we need to do it in the right way. Um, and, uh, you know, think about what we can know about that native history rather than what we probably can't know, like what the meaning of Tampa is, because um, it's probably part of that native history that's unfortunately lost. So thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say, wow, about that ending, because I did not know about that book. <laughs> and yeah. I guess it, it proves that you can you can get anything published. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah, kind it's of unfortunate. shocking. Yeah, it's well, it's shocking to me, because obviously there is extreme proof against that, especially since even if someone, I guess in my, the first thing my mind went to is even if someone thinks that they were paid, tricking someone into paying for something isn't quite the same thing as it not being stolen. Right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah. not the same thing at all. Um, wow. So that's, that's sad. And um, of, of course, like also the fact that he's Dutch. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, there, some people have even called this, um, this movement, uh, white innocence. Ah, yeah. yeah, it's the times we live in, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess so. Um, if you, oh, and if you want to stop sharing, we're seeing your homepage, just FYI. Oh, uh, I thought I'd stop sharing. Um, I don't think so. I, okay. I see all of your very well organized. There we I go. Just, perfect. I was trying to get it where I saw you again. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so interesting um, because same thing, I... Um, for those of you that know me, I live in Waco, Texas, which is also named for a Native American tribe. <laughs> so there are plenty of places outside of Florida that are also named for Native American. Oh, and absolutely. It's very, yeah. And it's very clear where those names come from. And yeah. um, I like I like to think that most of us are are proud from of how those names get developed and and where they come from because it's an acknowledgement of who was here before. Um, but I guess not everyone feels that way, unfortunately. Um, okay, we do have a question in the chat uh, from Anna Gingrich. She says, uh, thanks for an enlightening talk. I was wondering if you came across the earliest mention that a Tampa-like word was in fact used to refer to the Tampa Bay area. Um, no, uh, you can't get much earlier in terms of uh, historical written records than the 1550s, right? Um, uh, you know, we have the, we have, um, well, Ponce de Leon probably didn't make it up as far as Tampa. Um, we have the Narvaez expedition that landed um, in 1528, and then the DeSoto expedition that landed in Tampa in 1539. And, um, Interestingly, um, neither of those mention Tocobaga by name or Tampa by name. Um, they mention other native towns in Tampa Bay. Uh, you know, and I think that's probably just kind of, well, both Nervias might have gone to Tocobaga, but he doesn't mention it by name. DeSoto landed on the south side of the bay. And so he mentions towns that were on the south side of the bay more um, and the east side of the bay. Um, the Spanish themselves, as I mentioned, just mostly called Tampa Bay, uh, the Bay of the Holy Spirit, Bahia del Espirito Santo. Um, and so, yeah, we don't have any other kind of reference to the bay itself. I don't, I'd, yeah, it'd be interesting to know if Native people have a term for the whole bay. That does not come across, I don't think, in any of the historical records we have, unfortunately. I guess that leads into kind of my thought while we were coming across this is, I mean, obviously there are so many towns that are named for Native American words in Florida, but has um, has anyone asked the Seminole or Miccosukee if they, from, you know, from their records, um, have any sense of where the name may have come from? Um, through, you know, um, oral histories or 
anything like that? No, um, I'd, I'd be surprised if the Seminoles had any um, kind of oral traditions about the naming of Tampa. Um, you know, it is possible, you know, the Seminoles were Muscogean speakers, so they might have understood Tampa in terms of their own language, right? But as I mentioned before, there weren't any Seminoles, there weren't any Muscogean speakers around when the when the town was extant. Um, and, you know, that's why we can't translate it. Uh, but it's, it's, it is quite possible that they understood uh, Tampa as meaning near it in their own language. Um, right. It'd be interesting to know that. Um, there is another question in the chat, but I'm going to ask another question I was thinking of. So, so do you think that, you know, clearly the association with the Creek word, um, Itimpi, or the Choctaw word, Itampa, those clearly sound similar. So do you think yeah. that association simply came from the fact that they sound like it came from that word? <laughs> it was just you an know, assumption on, on the reporter's part? Uh, I think people just, you know, people just look for words in other languages that look the same, right? But that's not a good indication that they are no. kind of historically related, right? Definitely um, not a good basis of yeah. fact, no. Because if if we were going to go by that, then it would be not only Creek, Choctaw, some people have said Tunica, and Portuguese. So, oh, oh wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so in the chat, uh, someone asked, what happened to the indigenous people of Florida that got pushed to, into Cuba? Are there communities that still exist there? Um, not distinctly, you know, Floridian indigenous communities. They've been, you know, of course, mixed uh, in with the population. And so I don't think, um, you know, there's there's no, uh, I don't, I don't even think that there's kind of, uh, although we, you know, there hasn't been a lot of study because, of course, Cuba is not the friendliest place for American researchers to go. But John Worth and some other people have done a little bit of archival research there. Um, I don't get the sense that there is any kind of um, tradition or, uh, or memory of, you know, people coming from Florida, Native peoples coming from Florida, or that those communities managed to kind of like continue as their own distinct entities for very long. Um, you know, they were evacuated from Florida for their safety, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they went to better circumstances in Cuba. Um, so, unfortunately not. I guess my next question, sorry, I have a lot. Um, so, it's so interesting to me, this idea of the sticks of fire becoming really, I liked that graph that you showed that showed, it really started to come up in the 80s. Um, and it makes sense because it it does fit with kind of the story that they wanted to tell of the city, right? And how it was going. So, and so I guess, um, so was the newspaper the first place that showed up? I mean, it's so crazy how it's the exact phrase repeated over and over and over, but it started somewhere, right? Where you showed yeah. in, that, in that first one. You know, I... I... I did not look through the Chamber of Commerce um, minutes and stuff. I, I I looked around, and they're not easily accept, ex, right. accessible. Um, so I'm mostly looking at newspaper accounts and you know Tampa histories. And I, like I said, the the closest I can tell is the genesis of that shortened, abbreviated um, version is a is that anonymous newspaper story from 1974. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and this happened with the earlier translations too. You know, so much news is just deriv derivative. They just repeat what's already out there. And you can just see that even in terms of the spelling of Calusa, like I can tell that the guidebooks were were kind of borrowing from each other because they all use the 2O spelling of Calusa, which is kind of unusual, right? So you can kind of even see which newspapers and which guidebooks are borrowing from earlier versions of the same story. Well, it's like a paper version of the telephone game, right? Yeah, Where things yeah. just get transferred and transferred and changed. Right. Well, 
and well, and I love that you mentioned the Tampa Bay Lightning as a big hockey fan myself. Um, it does work so well with Tampa being the city of lightning and then having a huge sports team. And then I actually really like that sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I ever actually read the plaque to see that that's what it was based on was the assumed origin of the name of Tampa. So that's super cool to me because I did not know that, especially someone not being from Tampa. Um, but yeah, I, had, it, I mean, I had no fit. idea about any of this until I started getting into it either. It's just, it's not very well known. Um, mm. And I kept, when I started doing this research, I, I kept thinking, somebody must have said this before. <laughs> like, <laughs> somebody must have said this before. Um, but um, no, it it seems not. <laughs> so well, I wonder what the mayor would say, right? Because it, it seems like a lot of this, a lot of this really goes nicely with, um, with advertising for the city. And um you know, with this ideal of what Tampa is, you know, it fits nicely with what mm -hmm. they want to put out for tourism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, the nice thing about <laughs> if there's an upside to the fact that there is no translation is that people can claim whatever they want, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, all right. Do we have any final questions? Uh, does anyone want to come on and ask a question? Yeah, Dennis, I see your question, and, and I guess you answered your own question. But yeah, the the plaque is right on the fountain there, and in in, in in Plant Park. So go see it. Oh, and Dennis just made another comment. Mm -hmm. He says, "I liked your 1575 quote from Fontaneda and the Hammerton map from 1721 about Tokabaga Indians destroyed this in 1709." Or yeah. they were destroyed. I don't. <laughs> I, I can't say I like it, but it's 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 a startling notation on a map to just say, you know, that this native group has been destroyed. Um, it always kind of jars me when I see it. All, All right. right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think if no one has any further questions, uh, thank you so much for that interesting talk. I love to think about linguistics, right? And the, I mean, this was a tangent to that, but how these these words, where they come from and what we turn them into, right, in our own meaning and how they they end up having agency and we can take them where we want. Um, so thank you so much for that. Yeah, thanks, Cassie. Thanks, thank everybody. you so much. All right, bye-bye. Good night.